If Illinois' Gun and Magazine ban is upheld by the courts, are you going to have to register more than just that AR-15? Are you going to have to register certain parts that state police say are attachments for, quote, assault weapons? That's uh, something we're going to delve into right now with Springfield's Morning News. I'm Greg Bishop on 92.7 WMAY, Springfield's News and Talk. And uh, Mom at Arms, if you go to their website, mom-at-arms, or rather mom-at-arms.com, uh, you'll be able to see that uh, last month they reported this out and uh, they got their hands on a uh, memo. It's the Illinois State Police Law Bulletin, uh, and it talks about the Protect Illinois Communities Act, uh, and it goes into uh, a variety of other uh, you know facets of the law. Uh, it talks about how you know this is obviously a, a law of the land, and it's being challenged in court. But it talks about uh, what assault weapon attachments are, and further goes on to highlight. Mom at Arms does uh, additional requirements for possession. Uh, assault weapons attachments must also have provided an endorsement affidavit signed under oath to the ISP no later than January 1st of 2024, indicating that indeed attachments will have to be registered, or at least that's how some are interpreting this. So I did reach out to Illinois State Police and uh, just to confirm that this was indeed uh, a memo that was uh, sent around and State Police confirmed the law bulletin, Protect Illinois Communities Act. The purpose of the law bulletin, they said, is to provide legal guidance for ISP officers. And while the bulletin does provide a summary for officers, much of the language comes directly from state statute, with the exception of the Q&A, which can be found on the Illinois State Police website. So um, reaching out to somebody who knows about gun parts, uh, and that is Todd Vandermeid. He is a uh, former contract lobbyist for the NRA, longtime gun rights guru in the state of Illinois, and also somebody who's been consulting federal firearms licensees of Illinois on their challenge to Illinois' gun and magazine ban. And he was uh, gracious enough last minute as we had this slot open up to join me. Uh, Todd, uh, what do you take away from this, uh, this, this memo that uh, state police are confirming? It's as bad as I've been saying that, you know, they're talking about the attachments, but don't forget you have subpart I of Section 1.9 that deals in parts, not just attachments. And I know there's been some discussion. Um, the Washington law is different than the Illinois law, and Illinois law, you know, references any part. And so I think that what Mom in Arms is saying is exactly what I've been saying since this thing was passed. So for those who aren't versed in this, uh, what does this mean? Does this mean pins? Does this mean triggers? Does this mean springs? Uh, what exactly would constitute something that could be considered a, quote, assault weapon attachment? Uh, well, attachments and parts are two different things. So let's say that, you know, an attachment would be a if you replace the barrel with a threaded barrel, if you replace a, a certain stocks with a thumb hole stock or a pistol grip stock or something like that. Parts, on the other hand, would be everything from the springs, detents, dust covers, pins, screws, um, anything. And that's where it gets real, real mucky. And that's why uh, in the FFL challenge to the uh, gun ban, they went after guns, and then the right to repair the parts portion, whereas other groups challenge both guns and magazines. We're talking with Todd Vandermeid about uh, a memo that Illinois State Police have about uh, the need to register. How would you even go about registering these if that indeed is what is going to happen if this measure is upheld by January 1st, the deadline to register? Well, I would assume that the state police are going to do some sort of portal on their FOID website. We know how good they are at websites. Just look at the disaster that is the FFL website. Look at what they've done with the background check for private transfers to where they now want you to submit make, model, serial number, and all that. Um, you get This is why you know we should not negotiate with these authoritarian types because all they do is if you give them an inch, they will grab a mile and make you fight to claw anything back. There's nothing in 
the statute that gives them the ability to collect make, model, and serial number for a transfer. But they now claim that they have that right, and they are building a registry of every gun, every transfer. They're they're getting their holy grail uh, by fiat. That's what they're doing. And for certain people, it's going to be impossible to comply. It's absolutely going to be, I mean, you know, I was cleaning off a table the other day, and I started finding all kinds of parts that I forgot I had. Uh, you know, hammers, triggers, springs, things like that. And I had to start throwing them in a box, segregated from other things. And the other thing that the state has done nothing about explaining is what do you do when you have common parts? So this part will work on a shotgun that's legal. It'll work on an AR over here that's illegal. How do you delineate that? How do you sit there? Is it legal for me to, to have that and use that for my shotgun, or is it illegal across the board? And they don't have an answer for this. They are woefully uh, ill-equipped to answer this. And any time you typically try to get an answer out of the state police, it's like, well, look to the website or read the statute. And, that, and if you look at the questions, the, the only thing that they've done in these questions is they've restated the law. Talking with Todd Vandermeide, uh, of course, we've got uh, the litigation ongoing um, and uh, all the questions about whether or not this is going to be upheld by the courts in the Seventh Circuit. Uh, the Seventh Circuit case, though, Todd, as the cases are consolidated, you had different challenges on different aspects. Uh, do you uh, foresee that uh, the federal firearms licensees will, uh, you know, take that parts challenge and separate that out for a separate challenge? Because right now the consolidated case is just dealing with the general question of the Second Amendment. Amendment. But as you mentioned, FFL, uh, they went ahead and uh, really went into depth about the challenge of, you know, right to repair and the parts. Do you think that this type of, uh, you know, indication that people are going to have to register parts, um, which, first of all, the, the website issue, is that even secure? We had a breach of the uh, the FOID card website uh, by some hacker uh, not too long ago that could have potentially exposed addresses of people who are firearms owner identification card holders. So that's another aspect altogether. But do you do you anticipate uh, FFIL of going and in, in, in filing a, a lawsuit challenging the issue on uh, on these parts registrations? I think there are a couple of groups, including uh, the Aurora Sportsman's Club, who are looking very hard at these issues because uh, and while everybody focuses on October 1st, when the registration is supposed to open up, the, the real date is January 1. And the question is, are a lot of people going to be adjunct felons simply because they forgot to register something? Now, the state police is going to say in their benevolence, if you missed a spring or something, that's not going to be the end of the world. But at this juncture, I don't trust the state police. Uh, I, I think they're just, you know, the latest version of the Stasi um, based on the way they've been acting with this background check stuff and everything else. So uh, there are groups that are having conversations about how to tackle the registration issue as it gets closer to an implementation date, depending on what the Court of Appeals does. The Court of Appeals could sit there and enjoin all of 1.9 and 1.10, 1.9 being the guns, gun ban, the 1.10 being the mag ban, uh, we are now 30 days out from orals. Um, you know, sometimes decisions take six, seven months, but it would seem that with the registration date looming, I would think that they would want to get something out for more clarity sooner rather than later. And, I, and I've read a couple of things where just some people think Judge Easterbrook is the swing vote on this. He kind of knows what he should do as an inferior court. The question is, Will he do it or will he continue his rant on how wrong Heller and Bruin were decided? And that that's really the $64,000 question. But there's a lot of people who are looking at this and we're having a lot of conversations uh, with lawyers about how to tackle these approaches. And Todd, uh, finally here, uh, last week, the governor, during a so-called fireside chat about violence prevention, he was asked about the chances of the gun and magazine ban, um, well, uh, not being upheld. And he said, oh, it's not zero chance, it's not 30%, it's better than 30%, but that's still less than 50-50. 
your your thoughts on the governor? I mean, he he essentially conceded that this thing's going to fail in the federal courts eventually. Uh, should they have even have pursued this, knowing that? No, and that's going to cause. First off, it sounds like he took math at the Chicago public school system. Uh, second off, I don't. I think we're going to prevail in the long game. At the end of the day, uh, remember there was a gun ban that was up, and the court could have simply affirmed the, the ban, but they didn't. The courts vacated, vacated, and remanded with instructions to see New York. And it looks like you know you're getting a myriad of responses to that across the country and how judges are interpreting that. But I think the I, I think this is all virtue signaling to uh, you know the left, and I think this I think the, the plan for the governor and the Democrats is they didn't like the Dobbs decision, they didn't like a couple of the decisions. They are now wanting the Supreme Court to issue a couple of gun decisions. They're already going to take up civil orders on domestic violence restraints. They would love to have. Uh, something on ghost guns or bump stocks or something like that, and it looks like the court's going to have to rule on that based on what's happening in Texas. And then you've got a so-called semi-auto ban, or as they call an assault weapons ban, and they would love to say have the court rule in our favor for them to have a rally cry going into the 2024 election, knowing that these decisions will all come out sometime around June of next year, and with that... You will sit there and they will just flog the court's illegitimate. The court's, you know, got it wrong. This is a right-wing court. They'll do everything they can between now and them to plant the seeds of disinterest and and, uh, that the court's illegitimate and all that in their virtual signaling to the left to get them all whipped up in front of the 2024 election. They know that if there is a Republican Senate, uh, if, if the Republicans have either one house, their gun control schemes are largely dead. If the Republicans take the presidency and take the Senate to where they can appoint more justices or replace aging conservative justices, they know that their gun control is now dead for you know the next generation. So this next election is going to be super important uh, about that kind of stuff. Todd Vandermeij, we could spend an entire hour talking. Maybe we should do that sometime soon. Greatly appreciate you taking the time and uh, doing this on the last minute as uh, this slot opened up, and I wanted to get your take, so appreciate that. We'll talk again soon, all right? Be safe. Hey, stay in touch. Hope everything's well with the wife. Absolutely. You too. And uh, it is Springfield's Morning News on 92.7 WMAY, Springfield's News.